Well, this past week, I did something foolish. I was on Twitter, and not only was I on Twitter, but I saw uh, and read some of the comments uh, responding to other things that people had said, and uh, it was a dark and dangerous road, but I did see this commenting on someone else's post. It, this Twitterer said this, I never learned to truly loathe myself until I became an evangelical. Then I learned not only should I utterly loathe myself, God hates me more than I can understand. When I die and burn in eternal torment, God will make it clear just how much he hates me for all eternity. Now, I don't know this person. I don't know their story. I don't know what's going on in their life. But maybe you've read something similar or heard someone say something similar. Maybe you, even you yourself, have felt something similar. That God is angry with you for your sins. That God hates you. And so you go to the scriptures and you flip through, but all you see is, is God's wrath splayed out on every single page. This morning we're returning to the book of Judges. <clears throat> and we come to a passage that on the surface seems to feed into this kind of thinking. Someone who, who feels that God is nothing but a, a vengeful, wrathful being who, who does nothing but want us to feel bad about ourselves all the time will point to a chapter like the one we're about to read and say, see? And so, I guess I want to start with a question of, are they right? Does God hate you? Does God want you to hate yourself? Now, don't be quick to answer. Far too many people let their emotions get involved when it comes to reading Scripture, and they let their emotions dictate what the Scripture says. Nothing wrong with being emotional about what you read, right? God wants us to feel the truth that he's giving us, but it's another thing to let our emotions dictate meaning. Right? So my, my perceptions, how, how I think, how I feel about something is what gives meaning to that thing. And we do this all the time, right? You and I are in conversation together, and, and you say something. And not just the value of what you say, not just the importance of what you say, but the meaning of what you say is dictated by how I feel when you said it. And we do the same thing to Scripture, we read a passage, and what we do is we, we take it and we filter it through our emotions. And what comes out, we say, well, this is what that means. And that's such a dangerous thing to do, because most of the time we're not even aware that we're doing it. And our emotions are horribly inconsistent. So what we need to do is, as best as we can, when we come to Scripture and when we're talking with each other, is check our filters, right? Make sure that we are aware of how we're reading, right? As we're, as we're coming across the text, we need to ask ourselves, how am I, uh, am I bringing anything into the text? Do I have any preconceived notions? Do I have any feelings? Am I, am I reading this in light of current events, I remember shortly after 9-11, uh, uh, one of my first few years in ministry, um, Osama bin Laden was a lot, uh, in the news a lot, and uh, one of the ladies I worked with came to me and said, you are not going to believe what I found in my quiet time this morning. Look at this. And so she opened up to Isaiah 1-4, which says this, a ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers. And she said, did you see that? God told us this would happen. Because of America's sinfulness, we have been laden, and she said, see, bin Laden, with iniquity. And she was completely serious. That's not what that verse means, right? So we have to check ourselves and make sure that we're not reading stuff into the text that isn't there. So with that in mind, let's go to today's passage. We're in Judges chapter 10. As you flip there, remember where we left off a few weeks ago <clears throat> at the end of Judges 9, Gideon's son Abimelech had maneuvered and, and schemed to set himself up as king. And yet he proved to be a tyrant. Aside from murdering his own uh, 70 brothers, he cornered and killed the very people who helped him become king. And then he started ransacking his own cities. And thousands of his own people died because of his tyranny. 
And then finally, at the end of, at the end of chapter 9, Abimelech is killed. So chapter 10, we'll start in verse 1. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried at Shamir. After him arose Jair, the Gileadite, <coughs> who judged Israel 22 years. And he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities called Havath Jair, to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Kaman. So here we learn about two of the minor judges. They're called minor, not because they're unimportant. We just don't know much about them. Tola was a judge for 23 years. Jair was a judge for 22. We know a little bit about them, where they lived, something of their families. But in the end, we simply see that God used them to deliver his people. Israel had been settled in the land for about 250 years up to this point, but they kept needing deliverance. And the reason why is they kept chasing after, idol after idols. And so in order to wake them up out of their idolatry, chasing after the gods of the people, God would allow other people groups, other nations to come in and plunder them. And then after they'd been plundered, Israel would cry out, God, you've got to save us. And, and eventually he'd have pity on them and raise up a judge who would uh, defeat the plunderers. And so Tola and Jair are the sixth and seventh of these deliverers. But as we've gone through the book of Judges, we see that what the people are going through is not so much a cycle of, of sin and defeat and uh, repentance and then deliverance. It's not really a cycle as much as it is a, a spiral going down, right? They keep getting worse and worse and worse. And so after Tola and Jair, the writer of Judges lets us get a glimpse of just how bad things had gotten. Look at verse 6. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the Ammonites, and they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed." You really get a sense of the breadth of Israel's idolatry here. I mean, they again did what was evil. They served the Baals. They served the Ashtra, the, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines. I mean, this wasn't a one-time slip-up. This wasn't a, an isolated uh, area where just one certain group of people did something bad. No, this wasn't 10% of the people bringing everybody down. This was indiscriminate idolatry. This God, this God, this area, this area, it didn't matter. The people were giving themselves over to any God they could find. You see, sin has a, a desensitizing effect on us. You do something the first time, maybe you feel guilty. You think, ooh, I don't, I, don't, I don't like this. Your conscience is a little burdened. You're really careful not to get caught. But then you do it again. And the second time, you feel a little less guilt. Maybe just a small twinge of your conscience. A little less careful. And before long, you're doing what you thought you would never do. But here's what happens. The world tells us, the unbelieving world tells us, what's going on is your religion has kept you from seeing so many things. They say, you're narrowing yourself, you're limiting yourself. We have a whole wide range of experiences and activities that you could be doing. There's so much to enjoy. Open your eyes and see all the things there are to do. But Romans 1 tells us that what's really going on is that their eyes are blinded so they don't see things for how they actually are. 
It, it would be something like this. <clears throat> when I was younger, one of my family members uh, spent a few years in jail, and we didn't visit him, but suppose we had. You know, so we're sitting here, and the glass, he's on the other side, and, and through the phone, he's like, dude, life in here is amazing. The food is incredible. The beds are awesome. We, we have this TV in the rec room that you would not believe. You don't know what you're missing in here. That, that life on the outside, uh, you're missing a lot. This is the best life. Now, what if I were to sit and listen to him and think, gosh, I'm jealous. I mean, I, I have to share my room with my sister. He gets his own room, and he has a TV in the rec room. I don't even have a rec room. I'm jealous. That's ridiculous. But that's what we do all the time. We see a people who are blinded by their sin, going off in the way of destruction, who are the whole time screaming at us, saying, look how amazing life is, and we get tempted by it. And that's exactly what the people of Israel were doing. You have a people who are free, who had access to the one true God, getting enticed by a people that were blind and enslaved by their own idolatry. And so, as he had done before, verse 7, God says that he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who in turn crushed and oppressed Israel. And this sets the stage for pretty much the rest of the book. Next, we'll see, next few chapters, Israel is dealing with the Ammonites, and the few chapters after that, they're dealing with the Philistines. But for now, Israel's chasing after all of these gods, and God allows the Ammonites and the Philistines to plunder them. Let's see how the people respond. Look at verse 10. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, because we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the Ammonites and from the Philistines? The Sidonians also and the Amalekites and the Mayanites oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. So the people cry out, uh, uh, God, we messed up. And God's response is basically, yeah, you did. Again. And he points out the idiocy of what they did. He says, I saved you from these peoples, and yet when you left me, you went to the gods of the peoples that I defeated. And so if that's what you want, go ahead. Cry out to those gods for help, and Israel says, yeah, yeah, we know, we messed up. Do you lo I love what they say, like, um, do whatever you seems best, but you got to save us. you got to deliver us. Now, this is where we have to be careful. I said at the beginning, we can't let our emotions or current events shade the way we, we read this. Like, like the tweet that I opened with. See how angry God is? See how, how bad he makes these people feel? I mean, if God really loved Israel, wouldn't he make them um, feel okay with their decisions? I mean, if, if he really loved them, he wouldn't make them feel guilty. He wouldn't threaten them like this. And... Either because they don't like the idea of a God who ever gets angry or because they just want to do whatever they want or not have, not have consequences for it. Some people come to a passage like this and they put these emotional filters over it. And so they start simply by asking questions. They say, well, who is God to tell Israel who to save anyway, serve anyways? Why does he get to tell them what to do? Why don't they have the freedom to do what they want? Of course, what they really mean is, who is God to tell me what to do? Why can't I do what I really want? 
And so they do something like this. They'll say, well, you know, what's really happening here is this text was written by a person or a group of people who was interested in, in enslaving and, and conquering uh, uh, another group of people. And so what they did is they invented this God myth in order to, to bully and to, and to um, uh, threaten these people into submission. Therefore, this text should be ignored. This, this God should be overthrown. The dominant, this is the dominant promoted rejection of God's day, right? Whether academics or social media, the idea that's promoted, that's put forth is, I don't like what this book tells me to do. It's an attempt to control me, therefore I'm rejecting what it says. And so for a moment, let's entertain that thought. Let's start with a question that drives this sort of thinking. Why does God get so angry when people reject him? Why, does, why doesn't God let Israel or us do whatever they want? I mean, doesn't God know that if you love something, set it free, and if it returns, it's meant to be? And my first answer is Proverbs 14.12. It's also repeated in Proverbs 16.25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death and destruction. It's supposed to be 98 degrees today, heat index of 106. And so let's say after church you get home, you decide to play basketball in the driveway with your family, and after a few hours you come in, you're drenched and you're sweaty and everyone's complaining about how thirsty they are. So you grab, grab some Gatorade, you're handing it out to everyone, but your eight-year-old instead grabs a bottle of bleach and pours it into a cup. And says, I'm thirsty. I want to drink this. Now, you love your kid. You love your eight-year-old. So what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, hey, I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to let you do whatever you want. So go ahead, buddy. Drink up. Right? Or let's say your family takes a trip to the Grand Canyon. As you're getting out of the car, your 10-year-old uh, starts uh, saying, hey, I I'm ready to go. And you say, listen, you've got to stay close to me. There's a, there's a really deep edge. You don't understand how far you will go down. You'll die if you get too close. And, and they jump out of this car and, and they start screaming, no, I want my freedom. And they start running as fast as they can to the edge. Would it be the loving thing for you to do to say, go on, have fun? It would not be unloving for you to say, don't drink the bleach. I have something better for you. It would not be unloving to say, don't run off the edge of the Grand Canyon. I have something better for you. Love does not rejoice when someone chooses death over life. And so when we come to a passage like this, it is not unrighteous of God to be angry when people reject him and choose death instead. But let's come back to the question. Is this passage describing a God who hates his people? Is this pointing to a God that hates us? Is it teaching that if we want to be followers of him, we should hate ourselves? I mean, doesn't it say in verse 13 that, that God will not save his people because of their idolatry? I mean, doesn't he reject them in this passage? They even admit they were wrong in verse 10 and verse 15. And in verse 16, they repent, they, they put away their foreign gods, but it doesn't seem like it's enough. Why is God so angry at them? It's one thing to be miserable over your situation, it's another thing to be miserable over the sin that brought the situation about. It's a difference between hating prison and hating the sin that put you in prison. It's, it's shuddering when you experience the consequences of your sin against agonizing over the sin itself. You see, God lets Israel get a taste of life without him. He says, here's what life will be like without my protection. Here's what life will be like without my presence. And he did that so that they would be warned. They're running to the Grand Canyon, to the edge of the Grand Canyon, without stopping. They're, they're headed in a way of great danger. It'd be like your eight-year-old with the bleach. You come inside, you're hot, you're sweaty, and they say, I want to drink the bleach. You say, okay, look, just you smell that. 
Just by smelling it, do you feel how badly it burns your throat? Now, imagine if you were to drink that. You would die. By letting Israel suffer under the hands of these invaders, God is giving them just a foretaste of if you continue on in this direction, if you don't truly repent, this is what will happen. But Israel at first doesn't get the warning. I mean, they hated the fact that they were oppressed by the Amorites and the, the, the Ammonites and the Philistines. But they didn't hate their own idolatry. And that is where the difference lies. It would be like a man who got arrested for soliciting a prostitute. And then he goes to prison and he says, you know what, I am never doing this again. His wife comes and bells him out and she's like, what, what were you thinking? He's like, I've learned my lesson. I will never do that again. From now on, I will only cheat on you with people we know. That's exactly what we do. We hate what our sin has done, but we don't hate our sin. There's a vast difference between admitting you're wrong and repenting of the wrong that you did. Like Israel, so often we look around and we say, oh, um, I'm in trouble. Look at the destruction that's in my life. God is angry with me. I don't want him to be angry with me. How do I get him off my back? And so I clean up my life a little bit. And if I do, then God's going to have to make it better. But that's not true repentance. Even if there's sorrow for sin, even if you're sorry for what you did, that is not repentance. True repentance says, I hate my sin, not just what it does. I hate that I've dishonored God. I hate that I've brought destruction on myself and my people. It looked sweet. It looked appealing. But now I see that it's bitter and repulsive. And so repentance is, I've got I to get rid of it. I've got to shove it away. Not in order to earn God's favor, but because I loathe it, but because I hate it. And when we do that, we then throw ourselves on God's mercy and say, ah, look, I, I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve anything. God doesn't owe me anything because I repented. I don't deserve anything, but I beg God's forgiveness. It's, it's the tax collector that Jesus talks about who goes and, and he can't even lift his eyes up to heaven, but he beats his breast saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, we don't see a lot of repentance in the book of Judges. We see people who have temporary sorrow for their sin. They don't like the consequences that they've had to deal with. But they keep going back to their sin again and again. And each time they go, it's worse than the time before. But remember the purpose of this book. Left to our own, there is no stopping the depths that we will go to in our sin. And there's no leader, no military deliverer, no king that can help us. We, I mean, we may get temporary relief from our situations, but the book of Judges is meant to show us that we need more. And so the purpose of the book of Judges and the purpose of this chapter is not to describe how God hates and rejects his people. If anything, it's a clear description of how much Israel hates and rejects God. And yet, despite God's repeated deliveries, the people keep leaving him and they go back into death. But verse 16 gives us a glimmer of hope. It says that God is impatient over their misery. God does save them even when they don't deserve it. His impatience over their misery makes him extravagantly patient towards their hard hearts. And next week, we'll see how God raises up more judges to deliver the people temporarily. But you keep reading. You read past judges and, and into the New Testament, and we see that God, far from showing that he hates us or that we should hate ourselves, he shows his great love for us by sending his son, who's the ultimate judge, the ultimate deliverer, who will rescue us, not just temporarily, 
who will rescue us not just out of our situations, not merely from the consequences of our sin, although He does, but He actually is able to deliver us from the sin itself. Our hearts that love idols, that consistently choose death over life in Christ, God rips those hearts out and gives us a new heart that is able to love and follow and cherish God. And in doing so, he offers us this deliverance and freedom and salvation and joy. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's in his presence that there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forever, forevermore. God is offering himself to us today. And so you may be here this morning, and, and you may be in a situation where you're living in the consequences of your sin or someone else's. And it is destruction. It's ruin. And you're miserable because of it. And maybe you even feel the anger and wrath of God. But the very fact that you're alive today proves that God's anger has not spilled over. It's proof that you're alive today that God's wrath has not come fully upon you. And Scripture tells us that's because he's giving you time to repent. He's giving you time to choose his life over our death. And so we're told that we today can call on the Lord and be saved. We can experience his love and experience his mercy. And all the wrath and all the anger that was aimed at us, if we have faith in Christ, was put on his son. So that we could experience all the love that he had eternally for his son. And so we can call on God and be saved, but we can't do it like Israel did in chapter 10. We, we can't just simply use God as a way to get out of trouble. We can't simply use God as like, I don't want to be punished, so what can you do to help? Instead, we see God as the, the life-giving, the, the joy-sharing, the, the sin-removing God who takes us from death into life. We get to see him as he is and gladly shed off, throw off, repent of this sin and experience his mercy and grace that are found in the person of Jesus and in him alone. And so if you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. You, you may have been in church for a long time, but you've, you've had this relationship kind of like Israel where you, you go off into sin, you choose your own way, and then suddenly you're paying for the consequences of your sin. And you're like, oh gosh, sorry. Sorry, God, didn't mean to do that. But you haven't really been repentant. You haven't turned from those sins. You just wanted to get out of the bad. So today you can Maybe you are a believer and, and you have repented of your sin, but you still struggle with feeling guilty all the time and feeling like you're under the wrath of God. And you need to remember that that wrath has been poured out on Jesus. We no longer bear the, the weight and the shame and the, the hurt of our sin because it has been placed on Christ. We get to experience that life. Or maybe you're here today and you've never heard any of this. You're, you're like the one who tweeted earlier, where all this seems just like a silly myth in an attempt to control people. But maybe today God has been touching your heart and saying, it's time. Open up your eyes. Don't, don't proclaim your great sight while you're running around blind. Open your eyes and see the mercy and grace of a God who sent his son to die and rise again because he loves you. The call is to call on the Lord and be saved.